Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Brothers and sisters, we live in difficult times. We are tested every day. We are persecuted for our beliefs. And we desire for Christ to be our rock. We desire to draw nigh to God so that he will draw nigh to us. But at the same time, we are often negligent in terms of understanding that God is holy. And he says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And this is one thing we forget. We are forgetful hearers because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even though we are no longer under the law, the Mosaic law, we still have to remember that there is a protocol, decorum, in terms of drawing nigh to God. Today we have put on Christ, and therefore there is no longer condemnation for us in Christ. We have put on Christ, and we are justified to be in God's presence. But now that we have said this, this does not prevent us from making analogies with certain things, certain things that were being observed in the Old Covenant as fundamental principles that can guide us. And one aspect in which we are lacking today is the reverence of God. We have a tendency to say, I am born again. I have the spirit of the Almighty God in me. I have the spirit of Jesus in me. And now, I can just call upon him when I want to. That's true. But he doesn't want you to grieve him. He doesn't want you to grieve the spirit. And therefore, there is a decorum, meaning we cannot have one foot in the world, one foot in the faith, and think that God is pleased, and think that we have perfect fellowship with him. In 1 John chapter 1, John does say that ultimately he wants us to have fellowship not only with saints, but ultimately with the Lord Jesus Christ. But this fellowship requires that we sanctify ourselves. And today, I just want to help you have a different perspective about reverence, if it is the case that you may have fallen away from that understanding of reverence, which is still applicable today. And so we're going to go in the book of Esther, the book of Esther, chapter 4. So to put you in context, in the book of Esther, chapter 4, Mordecai has appealed to Esther so that she would rise up, being at the side of the king, to speak to the king about the cause of the Jews, about the situation of the Jews who are going to be under attack. You remember that evil was devised against the Jews by Haman, and that Mordecai learned about it and wanted Esther to speak to the king on the Jews' people behalf, so that something could be done to remedy the situation. And Esther was then called to go before the king in the court. And you remember there was a tradition that nobody could go to see the king to go into the court without having first been granted permission to do so. So let us go to Esther chapter 4. Let's start at verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called... There is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house, more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, 
Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also, and my maidens, will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. We now go to Esther chapter 5. Starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And so Esther was granted access in the inner court. She was granted access and had the golden scepter lifted for her so that she would be able to have the possibility to speak her request, to make her request before the king. Let us look at 1 John chapter 5. Let's start at verse 14. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And when you look at petitions, aitema, it means a thing asked, something that you ask for. So we have the possibility to ask the Lord what it is that we want to ask him. We have the petitions. We are authorized to come before his throne because Jesus is the way and he made the way manifest to the Holy of Holies. He made the way manifest to God so that we could speak and intercede for ourselves as priests to ask God what it is that we want. The way is opened and made manifest. And so we have to remember how Esther, before she went in unto the king, and I do go back now to Esther chapter 4. Before Esther went in unto the king, there was a time of preparation. There was a time of sanctification. It is important that we take time to sanctify ourselves regularly to rekindle that communion that we have with the Lord and to honor that relationship that we have with him. And this is why in verse 16, Esther chapter 4, verse 16, Esther understood that there was a preparation needed for her to sanctify herself to go before the Lord and be in his presence and ask what she wanted to ask to bring forth her petition, her request. And the analogy that we can make, even though we don't have the same formal protocol this is an image to make you understand that before you step in the presence of the Lord, take a second to cleanse yourself from the things of this world, to sanctify yourselves. You can fast. You can be in the Word. You can be in a 
climate that is proper for you to commune with God because God is, is holy. And so that's why we must have a sanctified life to have communion with the Lord. But we overlook that because we live in a time of over grace where we do not even feel like we have to respect God anymore because everything is taken care of. I believe on the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I am saved. I don't have anything else to do. You have to stay in a state of communion and fellowship with the Lord. And you can do that only by abiding in sanctification. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so this is the first image that we have here of Esther making sure that before she steps before the king, she has taken a time to sanctify herself because she's going to make a request to him. She's going to make a petition. And we likewise go before the Lord, interceding for ourselves as priests to make petition on our own behalf for ourselves. And so we have requests that we want to address to the Lord. But let us be respectful of the Lord. Amen. Likewise, for those of you who have read Esther, you know that earlier, even when it was time for Esther or Hadassah to go in before the king, before she was chosen by the king, there was a time of preparation before the women would go in unto the king. And then the king would call by name uh, the women that he wanted to see again. To see this, let us go to Esther chapter 2. Now when every maid's turn was come to go in to the king Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. We see here purifications, something used for rubbing, speaking of perfumes, and the purifying of the women. Again, pertaining to soap and perfume. And so there was a cleansing that was done before you would go unto the king. Now, this is a physical image of the cleansing that we must perform spiritually. Verse 13, Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. Let us go forward to verse 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So you see Esther, she took what was given her. She took what the king had prepared as a default package to deliver to the women. And so she received what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, had appointed. In other words, she did not try by her own strength to make herself appealing, but rather she relied on what was felt necessary as a minimum and as sufficient by the king himself to make herself clean. In other words, the analogy is that we don't have to come to Christ boasting and trying to make ourselves better than we are. Christ knows who we are and our faults and our limits, our limitations, and we cannot fool him by trying to put on an attire to deceive his eyes because all things are naked before his eyes. And therefore, you take his grace and his grace is sufficient for you. As the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
And so here the image is that what the king had provided for the women, it was sufficient for them to be able to stand before him. And so the grace of Christ is sufficient for you to come before him and you should come as you are and not try to act like you don't have limitations or to cover up those limitations with artificial means. But the bottom line remains that you still have to make yourself ready. And so there was a preparation before the women went in unto the king, which is the image again of ourselves having fellowship with the Lord. And the image of the Lord here is the king. Having fellowship with the Lord requires that you take time to sanctify yourself. You have to respect the Lord. If human beings were respecting kings who were in the flesh, how much more must we respect the almighty God when we go before him in the spirit to make our request, having the petitions to speak to him and ask what we need of him. Amen. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. We must not forget, brothers and sisters, for our God is a consuming fire. We must fear the Lord and respect him. Now, brothers and sisters, we turn to Malachi chapter 3, which is a prophetic passage speaking about the coming of the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an, an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, this is the Lord speaking, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widows and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord will come. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. And so we have the idea again that he's a consuming fire. But the people neglect the respect that they must have for the Lord. If we go to Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? And so people get careless, because judgment does not fall upon them quickly. People start to believe that they can continue being lukewarm, or that they can continue in sin, and that there is no consequence. They even get to a point where they may start believing that those who do evil are doing good because even those who are doing evil seem to be set up. Going back to Malachi chapter 3. Verse 15, And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. You see? People lose the fear of the Lord. We must not lose the fear of the Lord. We must understand that he deserves respect. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? 
And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts, unto you, O priests, that despise my name? And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? We have to honor the name of the Lord. We have to respect the Lord in the fellowship that we have with him and not take things lightly. But we get into the habit of what we call our walk with the Lord. We get into a habit where we feel comfortable not honoring the Lord to a higher standard day after day as we grow in the Lord. I spoke earlier of 1 John chapter 1, speaking of fellowship. Let us go and read it as well, because it also points to God being holy and that we must be holy as well. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so if you want to be one with God, you have to put on Christ, you have to put on light, so that you have the same nature that he has. This is why in 1 John chapter 3, we read in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be like him, similar to because we will be holy as he is. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 19, quench not the spirit, quench not the spirit. There is a protocol that we have to uphold. There is a decorum there is a respect that we must have for the things of the Lord. Going up to verse 17, pray without ceasing. Speak to the Lord, have communion with him, understand what he is communicating to you and express your concerns, having petitions to do that. Verse 18, in everything, give thanks. Give thanks. We must be thankful for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then quench not the spirit. Because when you behave in a way that is not godly, when you step away from sanctification, you're grieving the spirit. And there is a warning not to quench it. Amen. Now, getting back to the original idea, we saw that Esther... In the book of Esther, on two occasions at least, the first one when she had to go in before the king as a fair young virgin, before she was chosen, she went in before the king and there was a time of preparation and she came as she was and the grace of the king was sufficient concerning what she was given to prepare herself with. That's the first occasion. On the second occasion, she went in the inner court where one is not supposed to go unless they have been invited by the king. And the golden scepter was lifted up for her. And before she went and stepped in the inner court without being invited and still got the golden scepter lifted for her, she fasted. And there was a time of preparation. And these things, these analogies, they're showing us, even though they don't apply literally, Spiritually, there is an equivalent, an analogy that can be made that before we step in the presence of the Lord, even though we understand his spirit is in us, we understand that. But even when we want to fellowship with him and bond with him, we have to observe a protocol, 
of sanctifying ourselves, of living a sanctified life that we may truly have fellowship with him. Because our God is holy and also a consuming fire. So now we will go to Exodus. Again, we understand that we are not under the law, but we have to understand that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he still demands that we respect him and that we have enough reverence for him. For he is a great king, he says, and my name will be great among the heathen. He says that in Malachi chapter 1. So we go to Exodus chapter 19. This again will be a great illustration of what type of preparation is needed before we step before the Lord, or in other words, intend to have intense, close fellowship with him. Exodus chapter 19. Let's start at verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Verse 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. You see the image here, spiritually we have to be washed. Remember in Zechariah chapter 3, the high priest Joshua was spiritually washed by the Lord. The Lord gave him spiritual clothes that were clean. Here, it's physically happening in Exodus 19. Let them wash their clothes. Let them sanctify themselves. See, we see the meaning here, to make clean. Amen. Verse 11, and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And this is interesting. Again, the third day, there is a three-day preparation as there was for Esther when she went into inner court. And we know about the three-day fast. We also know in the book of Jonah, when we read in the book of Jonah, the people of Nineveh, they also fasted. And so there is a sense of reverence that people have when they want to rekindle with the Lord, rekindle their relationship with the Lord, and be found pleasant unto him. Verse 11 again, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And so beast and man are flesh. And we know that our flesh is marred. It is a seed that is corrupted. And therefore, when it comes in contact with the holiness of the Lord, it is going to be consumed unless the Lord himself allows that we get close to him. And so again, we understand this is not uh, in application today. We are no longer under this strict protocol. By the work of the cross, the Lord has reconciled us unto him. We put on Christ. We have a relationship with him, a fellowship with him in the spirit. But the point is we're trying to 
really remind ourselves that there is a decorum and a reverence that we should have uh, for the Lord. And we go to the Old Covenant to understand the importance of reverence in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? Verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And so he's calling them to take a break from intimacy with their wives. To lie with a woman is one of the meanings. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says that a, a wife and a husband should come together, but at times take a moment to fast and pray and be apart. Let's go and see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And so this is the first part of the statement, which lets us know that there is a time where we should step away from intimacy in the marriage to give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And you have to consent with your spouse as to when that time is ideal. But it should exist, this time when you're giving yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now, later in this chapter, Paul says, verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. And so there is a time when people must understand that even their marriage has to take a back seat concerning the things of the Lord, and the Lord must be a priority. And so even though you're married, let it not be that your marriage becomes an idol that would supersede your consecration to the Lord. Paul stresses this out in the following verses, verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belongeth to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. You see, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. There is a level of holiness that you can have in the body when you're not being intimate in the flesh. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And so, brothers and sisters... It is not a sin to be married. Of course not. But we have to understand, as Paul commands in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that there is a time when intimacy should be brought to a halt by consent so that the spouses can give themselves to fasting and prayer. Because there is a process by which, without intimacy, you achieve a greater level of sanctification. And in verse 34, we see this when it is said that the unmarried woman who cares for the things of the Lord, she can be holy both in body and in spirit. Amen? And Paul says in verse 35, And this I speak for your own profit, 
not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Without distraction. Free from domestic solicitude. In other words, without being solicited by your husband, by your wife, to a point where being solicited by them, you are no longer paying attention to the demands of the Lord and your consecration to him. And so why did I come here? Because we're making a parallel with Exodus chapter 19. Because the Lord told his people that they should not be coming at their wives. That was verse 15 in Exodus chapter 19. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. You're going to meet the Lord. Come not at your wives. Verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. To meet with God, to have an encounter with him. Amen. To have fellowship with him. Verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Remember, the Lord is a consuming fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Wow. Verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them sanctify themselves, to make clean. Now, the reason why in verse 21, some of the people may perish is because the Lord knows that some of them may not be thoroughly cleansed. Some of them may not have taken the warning seriously to cleanse themselves before they would come in the presence of the Lord. And so many of them could have perished. Verse 23, and Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people, and spake unto them. You see, the threshold to come in the presence of the Lord is so high that not everybody is qualified to just come up and be in his presence. Now, again, we are not under such a, a rigorous protocol that is so legalistic, but you have to remember and understand that these things were given for our instruction and for correction and reproof. And so when we examine ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, even now under the new covenant, even though we have put on Christ and his spirit dwells in us, are we honoring that and fellowshipping with him in a way that is pure by having a sanctified life and not allowing ourselves to defile the temple that our body is by being worldly in different regards? And we also examined how the intimacy within the marriage, sometimes by consent, it should be brought to a halt so that 
the spouses can give themselves to prayer and fasting, and this brings them to a heightened state of sanctification where they can get even closer to the Lord and have a more intense fellowship with him, the fellowship with the Lord that we're called to have, as John points out in 1 John chapter 1. So there you have it, brothers and sisters. We have seen through Esther and also through Exodus that there is a preparation that needs to take place before we go before the Lord, not in the way of a protocol as was the case in both these examples, but rather the principle remains that before you step before the Lord, you must be in a sanctified state. He dwells in you, but you should not quench the spirit. You should not grieve the spirit, even to the point of quenching it by your worldly ways, by your carnal ways, which war against the spirit. And so are we in good standing with the Lord? We have to consider our ways. We go to Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 and 7. Brothers and sisters, verse 5. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Twice the Lord tells the people, consider your ways. to analyze the course upon which you are walking, the mode of action, the way you are living your life, you have to consider it. And so in Haggai, there was a reproach that the people were not paying respect to the Lord because they had not considered rebuilding the temple while they had built pleasant houses for themselves. You see? And this again pointed to the fact that there must be reverence for the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And so this only confirms that we must have reverence for the Lord. And so what are the outtakes of this Bible study? Let's remember that the Lord commands respect. Let's remember that the Lord is holy, that he is a consuming fire, and that when we come near to him, when we want to have fellowship with him and draw nigh to him so he draws nigh to us, we must do so with a mind of having ourselves sanctified. We must do so by being ready to relinquish the worldly aspects of our life so we can truly commune with him and have the same nature that he has, putting on a divine nature that we may be like him and light as he is. Amen? And not neglect this. And not neglect this. Because many of us murmur against the Lord, saying we're not seeing the power of the Lord in our life, we're not experiencing the gifts of the Spirit. We're not feeling like we're blessed the way we should, and we say so speaking as fools. But on the flip side, do we ask ourselves, how consecrated am I to the Lord? How much am I giving the Lord? How sanctified is my life? Have I truly come to observe the commandment, love not the world, neither the things of this world? because the pride of life and the lusts of the flesh are not of the Father. Have I truly given myself over to the Lord? 
And so this is where we can examine ourselves and consider our ways. Because of old, the Lord required that people who would come before him would do so in a sanctified state or else they would be consumed. We take the grace of the Lord for granted and we think that because we have this grace that we have a license to just be imperfect. Now we are going to be imperfect in the flesh, but there is still a mind that we must have, the mind of Christ, to put him on and make it so it is Christ who is living through us and no longer ourselves. And so we pray to the Lord because he is the one who will give us that strength. And by being in prayer and also fasting when required of the Lord, we have this beautiful fellowship with him and we can do all things through him because it is him who gives us the strength to carry on and the ability to continue in the faith. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen.